and then I'll sure. go ahead and introduce um, our next speaker. Thank you, everybody, for um, asking questions. And now I'd like to introduce our last speaker of the session, nutritionist Tanya uh, Fryerich. Tanya owns and operates a virtual private practice that serves people living with lupus and other autoimmune diseases and can be found online as the lupus dietitian. With more than a decade of experience in nutrition counseling and a master's degree in nutrition, Tanya Fryich is passionate about educating and collaborating with her clients to find their personal path to health. She helps her clients make personalized, sustained dietary and lifestyle changes to reduce and eliminate flares, symptoms, and side effects. In addition to one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling, Tanya enjoys speaking to lupus support groups and runs a group coaching program, Better Live Better with Lupus Academy. Um, so Tanya will now present the many plates of lupus diet and lupus. Welcome, Tanya, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to speak on the topic. Obviously, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm so sorry about that. Let me put on my work mode. There we go. Okay, so I will share my screen. Let's see if it allows. It does, yay. Yeah. Thank you, Zoom, for cooperating today, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, great. So today we were talking about the many plates of lupus. The reason that I chose this title is because unfortunately, um, lupus is complicated and not everyone with lupus has the same symptoms. There's not one size fits all plan. Um, I'm sure if you've met others with lupus, you may realize, wow, well, their presentation, their symptoms, their struggles look very different than mine. Um, so because lupus is so multifaceted, there's not one solution either in terms of dietary changes. So we'll talk about the many opportunities to improve our dietary um, intake and our symptoms with our diet. So always there's a medical disclaimer. The information in this webinar is for educational purposes only. It is not meant to diagnose or treat medical conditions or replace your usual medical care. Always consult your healthcare practitioner for the most appropriate individual, individualized medical plan for you before making any lifestyle or nutritional changes. So what we will cover today include introduction, lupus 101, some nutrition basics, dietary do's and don'ts, and what are next steps. So in honestly, not only in my work with people, but if any of your care providers don't necessarily think in this way, it may be time to take a step back because you are a multifaceted person and all of these components really affect your health. So nutrition, of course, is really, really high up there. Uh, we literally become ourselves, our cells from the food that we eat. So we need those building blocks to continue living. Our body can either be made up of wonderful building blocks, lots of vitamins and minerals and nutrition, or if we're eating kind of a poor diet, we may not feel so great. And that's even taking out of account having lupus at all. Um, so we want to consider the potential dietary triggers and the things that can be helpful in reducing inflammation when we're talking about nutrition. Um, also, nutrition doesn't have to be perfect. So I really always set the tone right away. You don't have to be perfect. We can just have progress. So we can improve our diet um, and see great results too. Um, so don't let that uh, perfection and aiming for the stars stop you from getting to the moon in terms of improving your intake and how you feel. Movement. This is a really next Next step. So of course, when you're feeling terrible, when you have a lot of fatigue, when you're in a flare, movement is pretty low on the list. You may not feel as though that can be something that you incorporate right away, but as you're feeling better or on a good day, movement is really, really important to incorporate as, as tolerated um, for your joint health, for your cardiovascular health, to prevent osteoporosis due to long-term steroid use. Um, unfortunately, the cardiovascular disease and lupus are very intertwined. And that is something that affects many people with lupus. Um, so if we can have our movement, it's great for our heart health too. Mental health, this is so important. Um, 
because stress causes inflammation. So when you're stressed out, when your mental health is not in a great place, it's really hard to take care of yourself in other ways as well. So stress management and coping with your chronic illness are all great ways um, and really important. Support. So uh, your medical providers, your friends, your family, your support groups, all of those can add up as a really nice web or a net of support. So don't be afraid to ask. Uh, a lot of people are very independent and say, no, 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 I can take care of it myself. But sometimes you have a terrible day. Sometimes you have a flare. So that support is so important to take advantage of um, and utilize. It's not as though you are being high maintenance. You just need a little boost at that time. I'm sure for your family, your friends, if they needed your help and you were capable of providing it, you would. And your environment. This is another really important thing to take into account in terms of how you're doing with your chronic illness overall and what you can do to improve your symptoms or perhaps worsen them. So reduce your exposure to pollutants, chemicals, um, stop smoking, reduce your alcohol intake. All of these are great ways to change your environment so that you're having less inflammation. Now, the leading causes of mortality with lupus are, unfortunately, cardiovascular disease. People with lupus have three to six times the risk of death from cardiovascular disease um, on top of their lupus. Increased risk for fatal infections, often because we're on so many immunosuppressants, especially if you haven't been doing well. And kidney failure or lupus nephritis can advance. Unfortunately, kidney function is one of those things that any time that there's a lupus flare that causes kidney damage, we don't really come back from that. We can't go from stage four all the way to stage one kidney disease. Um, so being mindful of this is really important. Um, symptoms of lupus include extreme fatigue, pain, swelling in the joints, swelling in the hands, Raynaud's, headaches, hair loss, face rash, brain fog, sensitivity to light, also known as photosensitivity, rashes, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So these sorts of things may be things that you don't really connect with your lupus. You may have just thought, well, that's weird. I have a lupus flare and these other symptoms come before or after those, but they may be intertwined with your lupus. Now, I heard a very, very interesting um, talk from a doctor on this topic, uh, how doctors feel sometimes frustrated that they can handle the type one symptoms. So that would be um, nephritis, alopecia, vasculitis, cutaneous rash, other rashes, cytopenias, and inflammatory arthritis with conventional treatment. So that seems to be something that, okay, great, we can really improve upon this. Um, however, uh, the type one symptoms, the ones that I just listed, the severity varies with your disease activity and parallels with lab markers. So that's really um, kind of where your doctor will say, oh, I'm, I'm worried about this. Your labs look this way and you're having these symptoms. And then these type two symptoms are often where patients or uh, my clients will say, I'm so frustrated. My doctors say my labs are just fine, but I'm still having these symptoms of fatigue, widespread or diffuse pain, cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, sleep disturbances, depression, anxiety. And that mental health component can also be a symptom of your lupus. Those two can be intertwined. So type two symptoms are often persistent and unfortunately chronic. They're usually not responsive to those conventional medications or prescriptions. Um, but this is where you can make a really big difference with your movement, with your diet, um, and see that inflammation come down another way. So how can nutrition help? Um, certainly, if you are struggling with weight gain or have become overweight or obese because of your lupus medications or during your course of lupus, nutrition can help with weight. Also, if you have any food intolerances, and sometimes people ask me, well, I, I'm not sure if I have food intolerances, which is a great question to have. Um, those may range as, hmm, I get a mild stomach ache after I eat this, or a terrible headache. Um, 
that could be your, the food. It could also be other things. So that's why we investigate together, um, talk about what foods you're eating and then your reaction to those and really pay attention. Uh, certainly nutrition can help improve your nutritional status. So if you are deficient in anything, we can fix that with nutrition. So um, oftentimes people with lupus are photosensitive. That means that Unfortunately, when they are exposed to UV light from the sun, it flares their lupus symptoms or flares their lupus um, into a flare. Um, if you really, really avoid the light, you may then become vitamin D deficient. Um, so that's where nutrition or supplementation can make a huge difference. When we're vitamin D deficient, it's not great for our immune system, certainly not great for our fatigue either. Gut microbiome and integrity. This is so important. So gut health and our immune system are so interconnected. Um, if we have leaky gut, if we have gut dysbiosis or a off kilter between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, that can all affect our lupus symptoms. So we want to pay attention to those things and see what we can do in terms of our diet and nutrition. Where to start with nutrition? We can do balanced meals, balanced plates, heart healthy nutrition, reading nutrition labels, working with our food to reduce our inflammation, and increasing our nutritional content. So you've probably seen so many things about superfood this, superfood that, um, but there are some things that actually are pretty anti-inflammatory and can really help your lupus, which would be fantastic. So popular diets, uh, many people ask me about these keto, paleo, AIP diet. So I did want to address this very quickly. Um, keto diet is mostly high in fat. A lot of people take this to a bit of an extreme and do like bacon wrapped cheese or a lot of red meat and cheese. That's not the great way to go with keto. It's not great for our cardiovascular health. And that's what we want to protect. We want to reduce that inflammation down. Um, so keto, sometimes people take it down another path and do more like salmon, eggs, nuts, seeds, um, and really try to increase their vegetables. Um, but the, the problem with keto is it's very, very restrictive in terms of the amount of carbohydrates that you can consume while you're on ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet was actually created for people with epilepsy that had terrible seizures and couldn't function. And it really does help them. Um, I will say that I have seen many, many, many clients come in, they've tried keto, they lost a little bit of weight at the beginning. And then they kind of felt a little bit terrible called the keto flu. Their energy bounces back, but long-term it is really hard to stick with and they didn't actually feel that great long-term. So keto isn't one of my favorites. Um, it can be easy to become nutrient deficient if you're following keto, but there's modifi modified ways to implement some of those ideas and see better results. Um, paleo, honestly, there's really, this is such a wide open area um, in terms of that can mean a whole lot of things. Um, here it shows avocado and nuts and salmon, but everyone's kind of making up their own rules with paleo. If we really take uh, the diet that we were likely on in the paleolithic area, it should be mostly just nuts and berries and things that we forage. Um, and that's not what it looks like today. So that one's kind of like a very vague term that could mean a lot of things. And it could be fine, but it could be not that helpful. The reason that both the keto and the paleo diet that I voice my concern is that they're very high in animal proteins, which again, isn't great for our cardiovascular health. Now, the AIP diet, this is one of those that have been floating around, especially in the autoimmune space, um, because, it, so AIP stands for autoimmune protocol. It essentially eliminates nearly everything, really brings your diet down to the bare bones. And what it does in that is you have this elimination period, presumably your symptoms would be eliminated in that time. And you slowly start to reintroduce things one by one. And as you reintroduce things, then you check for your tolerance of those. Um, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to really introduce myself at the very beginning. Um, 
I did want to say one other thing. Lori gave me a beautiful introduction, but I also have lupus myself. And so I have been able to put my symptoms and flares into remission for quite a few years because of my changes to diet and lifestyle. So not only am I speaking from experience as a dietitian for more than 12 years, but also as someone that's implemented this in my life and applied these things. So that's why I speak on both the expert side and the patient side. These are the ones that I have heard more recently from people. I get a lot of questions about this because I'm so active on social media as the lupus dietitian. People reach out very often and ask questions of, well, what about these diets? Um, I don't know where they're coming from. Um, I don't really recommend them, but I'll explain why. So the carnivore diet, someone has explained this to me and I looked it up. It's literally just red meat and water and salt. This is not good for us. Please don't do this. Um, it is terrible for our cardiovascular health. It's going to be terrible for your gut microbiome, terrible for your digestion, and honestly, your energy. This is so nutritionally incomplete. So I'm not sure where it came about. Um, I would not recommend it. Another diet that I've seen is all just raw vegetables, um, also nutritionally incomplete. So we don't want to focus ever on just one food group or just one food type. Uh, we really want the spectrum. Um, the last diet that I really wouldn't recommend is essentially not eating too much, but loading up on 20, 30, 40 supplements. It's incredibly dangerous. Our supplements are not well-regulated. Um, so while it says something on the label, you may be getting something completely different. So I wouldn't recommend these at all. Um, each one of them though makes sense in moderation. So it, the dose makes the poison. We could have a little bit of red meat. Raw greens are wonderful, but it, your whole diet shouldn't exist on it. And adding supplements carefully and mindfully can also be really helpful. So other popular diets to talk about, uh, vegan diet, that's another one that I get a lot of questions about, and at least this is more balanced. So you're getting uh, plant-based proteins, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, chickpeas, a wide variety of nuts and seeds. This can be quite fine. Um, sometimes people do need supplementation of B12, for example, which is a little difficult to get sufficient amounts from your diet if you're completely vegan, um, and vitamin D, which we've already talked about due to the photosensitivity and lack of those um, sources. Now, vegetarian, this is also kind of a, a vague term that could apply to many things. Uh, vegetarian is not plant products or all plant products, not animal products. Um, but sometimes people are pescatarian. They include fish. Sometimes people um, may include a bit of chicken every once in a while. I am not opposed to people making it their own. I think that's actually exactly what you should do. So in the middle, I put what you want. <laughs> so uh, everyone can figure out this perfect melding of things that they can't get up because of nostalgia, because of their culture, things that they really need, to, a food that they need to have in their life. And depending on the health promotion of that food, maybe you have it a little bit, maybe you have it more frequently. Um, but there's still room for that. Um, you can also try to go for something like vegetarian or vegan, eat mostly plant-based and every once in a while have an animal product. So there's really no one right path. Everyone with lupus that I have as a client or other autoimmune diseases, I work with them on their specific, let's say, Mary, uh, the Mary diet or Kamaya, the Kamaya diet. So there's not one, one size fits all. Please, please, please. Um, don't feel as though you're a failure if you've tried some of these diets and found that they didn't work. They're not perfect for you. Um, we're all so individual and that's a beautiful thing. So here are some more examples of the many plates of lupus, but how we can modify that for ourselves. So I really do tell people, no matter what of those diets that you're going for, aim for 50% of the plate to be vegetables. So that could be uh, collard greens, it could be a salad, it could be broccoli, it could be sauerkraut, it could be kimchi, it could be so many things, um, maybe guacamole with a salsa. So don't 
don't feel as though one cuisine is the right way to go either, but consuming 50% of your plate as vegetables is a fantastic way to make sure that you're getting enough fiber, enough antioxidants, enough phytochemicals, vitamins, and nutrients. And then 25% of the plate should be your protein, depending what you are. If you're vegan, maybe it's beans and lentils. If you're vegetarian, maybe you're including yogurt sometimes. Um, pescatarian, fish. A carnivore, you're going to do the red meat um, or paleo and chicken. All of these are great examples of ways to get protein in your day and help you feel energized. So if we're not consuming enough protein, we can feel a little depleted, not very satisfied from our meals. But on the flip side, we don't want to overdo it, especially if you have lupus nephritis. Too much protein is a little bit of hard work for your kidneys, and we don't want to do that for your kidneys. And the last 25% should be your carbohydrates. So rice, tortillas, um, quinoa, bread, pasta, potatoes, so many things, corn, stout count as carbohydrates. And we don't want that as a standard American plate. It's usually 50% carbs, 10% vegetables, and then the remainder is protein. So if we can switch those proportions around, you will feel um, incredible, much better. So back to cardiovascular health and why that's so important for people living with lupus. Uh, cardiovascular health is one of the leading causes of death amongst people with lupus besides kidney disease and kidney failure and infections. Um, it's really easy to start with changes that can improve our heart health. So reducing salt reduces your blood pressure and your fluid retention. Reducing your red and processed meats helps to reduce your cholesterol your sources of sodium, sources of saturated fat, nitrates and nitrites, which aren't great for us either. The leading cause of cancer amongst 30 to 45 year olds, I believe was the age range that um, now is colon cancer. And unfortunately that's really scary. Uh, that's a very young age group to be afflicted by colon cancer. Um, and oftentimes the thing that they're thinking is contributing to it is processed foods, particularly processed meats, um, a generation that really struggles with constipation because of processed foods means that we're absorbing back a lot of those things that we should be excreting because it's sitting, our bowel movements are sitting in there too long. Uh, reducing trans fat. Trans fat is terrible for us. It is also known as hydrogenated vegetable oil. It may be found in the ingredients list. A word to, of caution is that in the nutrient label or nutrition label, they may not say that there's any grams of trans fat because if it's less than 0 0.5 per grams, they can say it's zero. So that's where you need to look in the ingredients list because we do not want any trans fat in our diet. It is really, really bad for our heart health. The places that you may find trans fat would be um, processed foods, those croissants that come in a 12 pack at a superstore and are, set, are completely soft and delicious a week later is a sign that it probably had trans fat in it. As you know, if you get it from a bakery, it's stale the next day. So they're putting something to preserve it for much, much longer. Um, Eliminating trans fat can help really reduce inflammation, and it's so much better for your cardiovascular health. Um, other places that you can find trans fat may be margarines, um, like cookies, cakes, baked goods, snack foods. They may be kind of sliding it in there. Um, those processed meats may be things like bologna, deli meat, hot dogs, um, spam, anything that is again, pretty high in sodium and pretty processed. Something that I wouldn't count as a processed meat would be something like rotisserie chicken, where they're just kind of roasting it. And reducing salt. So you do want to look on the nutrition labels for sodium. Sodium um, really shouldn't exceed 2000 milligrams per day. For some people that really need to be on a more restricted diet, they may have to be less than that. But that's a good ballpark to go with. Um, and something like a canned food, for example, may already have 800 milligrams. I usually recommend people, if you're shopping for your groceries, the canned foods to have that are okay would be like salmon, tuna, chicken. Look at the sodium content. It's usually not that bad. Otherwise, really kind of try to avoid the canned foods. If you're choosing things like vegetables, go with fresh and frozen the majority of the time.
and heart healthy choices. So we want to increase our fresh produce. That can be any color of vegetables, fruits, um, really anything that's pretty unprocessed. So maybe you're getting like sprouted beans or lentils, um, but in terms of vegetables and fruits, we also want to eat the rainbow. Um, each color represents different nutrients. So if we're choosing different things like red and blue and um, orange, then you're getting different nutrients too. So red and orange usually have vitamin A in them. That would be like carrots, for example. Um, green, like leafy greens and broccoli has vitamin K in it. Um, and something like uh, blue, like blueberries um, that has other vitamins. So making sure you're having a colorful plate or colorful throughout the day is a great way to make sure that you're also getting a balanced nutrition and intake. Um, it also increases your intake of phytochemicals, antioxidants, fiber, yay, helpful for reducing that risk for colon cancer, and vitamins and minerals. A lower glycemic index, higher fiber. When we consume things that are lower in glycemic index and higher in fiber, it's great for our digestion, it's great for our gut microbiome, and um, we feel much better after consuming this. You feel more satisfied for longer. Um, you oftentimes may notice your appetite is decreased, especially if this is anyone out there that is trying to lose weight. Um, choosing these sorts of foods is a really great idea. It helps you in a lot of ways. Also having more stable blood sugar, hormone balance, um, more energy throughout the day, sound pretty nice, um, can help with your lupus symptoms as well. And lastly, the omega-3s or the polyunsaturated fatty acids, also sometimes pronounced as PUFAs, um, help in terms of reducing inflammation. They're very satiating. They can reduce your body weight. Um, and so healthy for us. So the examples here are things like salmon, chia seeds, hemp seeds, fish oil, walnuts, almonds. Um, other fish could be sardines, tuna, herring, anchovies. Those are all great sources of omega-3s. The lower glycemic index and higher fiber foods may be lots of vegetables, whole grains instead of refined grains. So brown rice instead of white rice, quinoa instead of white bread, many examples there. And then we talked about the fresh produce already. Now, if you're at the grocery store, what can we look for? We want to increase our things like fiber, potassium, unsaturated fats, protein, vitamins, and minerals. Um, these are all nutrients that sometimes people struggle with getting enough of. So fiber could be more vegetables, more fruits, more whole grains, um, a nut and seed type bread instead of white bread. Potassium can come from things like bananas, spinach, avocados. Um, a lot of fresh things have potassium. Unsaturated fats would be those omega-3s um, or other nuts and seeds, olive oil, canola oil. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not canola oil, avocado oil are unsaturated fats. Um, canola oil does, but I'm not a big fan of recommending that too much. It's higher in the omega-6s. And if you're eating any sort of snack foods ever or foods in the American food system, like going out to eat, you're probably getting plenty of vegetable oils, but not enough olive oil or avocado oil. Protein, uh, protein can come from animal sources for sure, but if you can get it from plant sources, that's a great idea as well. So nuts and seeds, beans, lentils, chickpeas. We do have to err on the side of caution. If your lupus nephritis has advanced to the point of advanced kidney disease, then we don't want to consume too much protein vitamins and minerals. That's always really exciting. Obviously, we, we would love to get them naturally. Um, a lot of things that are a great source of vitamin and minerals don't have nutrition labels. Like you're not going to see a nutrition label on your apple. Um, but if you can get it from foods like that, fantastic. Um, if you're consuming something that's coming with a nutrition label, maybe like a brown rice, for example, that's going to be higher in vitamins and minerals than something like a refined grain. Although for some things, they do supplement back in, they add back in. We do want to decrease our salt or sodium. We do want to reduce our saturated fat intake. And we want to avoid trans fats. So reduce your added sugars. Um, Added sugars are such a hot topic these days. Uh, honestly, if you can really reduce them in general, 
great for inflammation. You don't have to go down to zero. So the American Heart Association recommends something like 24 grams of added sugar as a limit. If you're having a soda, you're probably already at like 48 or 64 grams of added sugar. Um, so maybe soda is a great place to reduce. Or if you're from the South, uh, sweet tea. If you put several pumps of coffee when you go to your coffee shop, that's all added sugars that we really don't need in our day. Um, if you have that sweet tooth, perhaps just taper it down slowly. We're consuming a little bit less over time and your taste buds have time to acclimate to it. We talked about the trans fats. We talked about the saturated fats and the sodium. So I feel like you all know exactly what I mean with those. So what are inflammatory foods? These are lupus focused. Tartrazine is also known as yellow number five, FD and C yellow five. It includes, it, it may be in foods like candies, chips, crackers, cereal, unfortunately, makeups, and medications. Tartrazine is from the family called hydralazine that can actually cause drug-induced lupus. There's been some old research studies about how it can worsen lupus symptoms, so we really just want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, you don't need this. There's no nutritional benefit to yellow number five. It's just a food dye, and it it's usually in foods that we shouldn't be eating very much of anyway, like Skittles or Fruit Loops in terms of like those little colorful cereals. If you can just avoid this, that would be fantastic. High fat and high salt is something that we've talked about. The saturated fats or high sodium, those may be in foods like processed meats, TV dinners, frozen meals, canned foods. Um, both of them kind of go together in a lot of these things. They're just really processed. Um, both of those you don't need in your life. Um, and that really applies to anyone, not only people with lupus, but anyone that's just trying to choose healthier items. Ultra processed foods. Um, these would be anything that's shelf stable for years and years and years besides something like honey. Um, that maybe the ingredient list has 55 ingredients. Um, there's a lot of added ingredients. There's a lot of added preservatives. Not so great for us. Soft drinks, chips, chocolate, candy, ice cream, breakfast cereals, packaged soups, chicken nuggets, hot dogs, french fries, anything that's just honestly super processed probably is also losing a lot of nutrition along the way. This is specifically for lupus again, our alfalfa seeds and sprouts. So they contain l cannabinine. This can be found on certain dishes like sandwiches, pho, pad thai, stir fries, salads. This component irritates lupus symptoms for some people. Uh, there are a lot of nutrient benefits of the alfalfa seeds and sprouts, but thankfully there's also other seeds and sprouts out there that can be a wonderful addition to your diet and not be inflammatory uh, for lupus. Excessive alcohol, we all know that this isn't great for us. So intoxicated has the word toxin in there. Um, it does cause unnecessary inflammation, not only to our livers, but in a lot of other places. It's not great for our gut microbiome either. That would be including beer, liquor, cocktails, or wine. So if you're trying to reduce your intake of alcohol, what I usually recommend is doing something like having an alcoholic drink and then a, a glass of water. And you can always make it look like a mocktail too. So maybe get seltzer water with a lime and in a cup that it would make sense to have a vodka soda. And that way, if you're a little bit worried about people questioning what's going on, why are you not drinking? Um, obviously, you should feel safe to say, hey, I'm looking out for my health. I'm trying to reduce my alcohol intake. But if you don't, if it's a setting that you don't feel comfortable, you can always go with that um, so that it appears as if you're drinking alcohol, but you're not. Um, also, it's actually quite funny. It's been quite trendy to be like sober curious or not drink at all. So that is becoming part of our culture where people are kind of realizing I don't feel so great when I drink a lot. Um, and that could be something that makes it more socially acceptable. Or you tell your friends, hey, I don't feel great when I drink and I'm cutting down. Um, excessive sugar. So uh, we talked about this briefly, but just to reiterate, um, not only the natural sugars, but also the artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners, that could be like Splenda, Stevia, NutraSweet, 
oh, there's so many of them, equal, um, all of those fake sugars. And now like monk fruit has become more popular. Um, all of these are very processed. So sometimes people say, but the stevia or the splendor, the monk fruit, isn't that from a natural source? The problem is that it's still ultra processed to be 2000 times the level of sweetness as something like a spoonful of sugar. They also can sometimes interact with our gut microbiome in a negative way, encourage the bad bacteria to flourish and discourage the good bacteria. We want that to be in a great balance and it doesn't help with that. Now, natural sugars, that could include brown sugar, honey, uh, molasses. Uh, there's so many different things that could be a great source of sugar. And if we can taper down how much you need for it to taste sweet for you. For example, you can use something like cinnamon in place of it. That is another great way to reduce your sugar intake over the long term. Um, you don't have to be perfect. Again, progress, not perfection. Um, but that is a wonderful way to um, reduce your intake of added sugars. Oftentimes when we're consuming a lot of added sugars, you're displacing things that are a little bit healthier for you. So what are some helpful changes? I always like to end on the positive note and where we go from here, our future. So helpful changes would include adding more vegetables to your plate. Obviously, the rainbow of vegetables would be fantastic. Um, if you like five vegetables, great. Just consume those five vegetables on heavy rotation. <laughs> Maybe come up with fun ways that you can prepare them in new or different ways. Healthy fats, that could be your salmon, your tuna, your sardines, your anchovies, your herring, your walnuts, your almonds, chia seeds, ground flaxseed, avocado oil, olive oil, um, so many different options out there uh, that can be really great way to increase your omega-3s. High intake of unprocessed foods, so more fresh fruits, more vegetables, um, more really anything that's pretty simple. If there's one ingredient on the label, great. You've gotten an unprocessed food. Um, brown rice could be another one. Uh, tofu, one ingredient. So look for things that are just really straightforward and haven't been processed down to the nth degree. Um, if you can, switch out your vegetables from the canned to the frozen or fresh. Those are very nutritious um, and maintain a lot more of their phytochemicals and antioxidants less meat, and more plant proteins. So instead of a steak one night, if you can have tofu, grape swap, instead of um, a pork roast one night, perhaps everyone goes in for uh, a delicious beans, bean enchiladas. I'm just thinking of different dishes. Um, so there's so many delicious ways to have plant proteins that can not only be delicious, but also really a great source of protein. You're not losing out on how much protein you can consume by getting it from plants. And the bonus is you're getting a lot more fiber, um, vitamins, minerals that you may be getting from meat. Add gut healthy choices. So this can include things like probiotics, prebiotics, um, fiber, all of that encourages the good gut bacteria to flourish. Um, things that help prevent or heal a leaky gut would be things like bone broth or collagen because they contain collagen and it helps build up those tight junctures again in our um, gut. Spices, don't forget to flavor your food. I love ginger and turmeric and cinnamon for how anti-inflammatory they are and delicious, um, but you can use so many spices that can give your food fun flavor, mix it up a little bit, and also um, give you a boost in terms of, they do have a little bit of vitamins and minerals, but also components, active components that can help you. Um, and rethink your drinks. So let's move away from the things that have a lot of added sugar. Um, let's move away certainly from those processed energy drinks that give you tons of caffeine. It's very overstimulating for our system. Um, have more water, have more uh, smoothies that you can, can decide what goes in them. Um, have some unsweetened coffee or tea, um, have a, any sort of brewed herbal teas are wonderful, green tea is great. So there's so many ways that you can make your drinks work harder for you. 
And I do want to leave time for questions. So thank you so much. Here is how you can reach me on the web at www.thelupusdietitian.com or email at tanya at tanyabnutrition.com. You can follow me on any social media site at all, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. So please don't hesitate to reach out if I can be helpful to you in any way. Um, and I do want to give time for questions. So do we have any questions yet? Hi, Lori. Hi there. Thank you, Tanya. That was so good. My gosh, I learned a ton. <laughs> yeah. I know I need to change my diet is what I'm hearing. So yeah. So if anybody has questions, feel free to type them in now. Joanne, if you have any questions, you can pop on and ask as well. Um, Tanya, before you joined us, Joanne was sharing um, her, her food um, changes that she's made with her Hi. lupus. And hey. um, it's, it was really interesting, you know, how, how that, uh, it, it's amazing how much food affects us. I know it's the simplest yeah. of things, but it's so true, right? And very, very true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have so many clients that are so frustrated because they've tried so many diets and they're like, I'm not seeing the consistent results and they just haven't found the right approach. So that's usually what I help people with of, okay, what are your true food triggers? And then where do we go from here? What yeah. can we craft your diet around. And the, the difference is amazing. I mean, their energy pops up in two or three weeks, joint pain reduces, their rash goes away. Like, oh, what a new lease on life. I bet. I bet. Are there simple, um, what's the simplest way to, tr to track your, your, um, how food affects you, do you think? Oh, great question. Um, you can always do a food log and then a symptom journal. And so I eat these sorts of things. And then I notice, whoo, the next day I feel terrible or I have terrible diarrhea. And then sort of play detective of, ooh, I've noticed now every time I eat this, it doesn't go so well. Or this type of food, maybe for someone, for example, it might be dairy. I think a lot a lot of people are more lactose intolerant than they believe. Um, and then if they eliminate it, they're like, wow, I feel so much better. Okay. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and are there common threads? Like I know my sister can't eat some of the nightshades. Mm, great question. Yeah. So um, there's, there's a list of inflammatory foods that can be problematic for autoimmune. It's so dependent on that person. Uh, but nightshades is one of those things. Um, and for everyone out there, nightshades would be things like tomatoes, tomatillos, peppers, a white potato, not the purple potato or the sweet potato, um, and eggplant. So those are paprika is a spice too that is made from bell peppers um, and spicy peppers. Those are all nightshades. And those can be triggering uh, for people with autoimmune disease, but not everyone. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. Don't forget people, please type your questions in. This is a great opportunity to get them straight from the source of a great, of a great nutritionist who also has lupus. So it's the best of Oh, strangely the best of both worlds but I know unfortunately well, it's okay I don't mind um you know they always say there's a silver lining to the cloud so I've had autoimmune diseases my entire life um my first one was diagnosed when I was 12 and I've never been of the opinion of like oh this is terrible like why does all this bad stuff happen to me I just kind of took it in stride and tried to figure out okay well what does this mean? How can I make this a positive? And I got into nutrition very early on because I realized, wow, like this does make a huge difference in how I feel. Um, and then realizing that there was such a lack of good information out there for people with autoimmune diseases um, and diet that really fuels my passion. Because even if people don't decide to work with me, hey, I've given them information that can make them feel better. And that's a really amazing thing to bring into the world. Absolutely. Joanne, did you have a question? Hi, I do. Um, thank you so much for sharing all that information. I do feel like diet plays such a huge role. And, you know, sometimes we don't understand that. So breaking it down like that really helps show people what is actually in our food. And I am not perfect by any means. I try to follow. I wanted to ask, because this is something that I've uh, heard from my doctors, that with lupus, we 
are almost all dealing with low, extremely low vitamin D and B12. Do you feel um, that we can get enough of that in our food or that that is something we also need a supplement for? Great question. So if you're vegan, that would be exceedingly difficult. Um, photosensitivity makes vitamin D deficiency more prevalent amongst people with lupus because they're avoiding the sun because it triggers their lupus symptoms. So that's a tricky situation. And then also as everyone ages, no matter if you have lupus or not, we absorb and utilize B12 in our diet less and less. So oftentimes people that are, um, let's say, increasing their number of years on this beautiful earth um, may need B12 supplementation because it's just harder to absorb. Uh, I wouldn't say it a blanket statement for everyone with lupus because I've seen people that have great vitamin D levels and they go out in the sun very sparingly. Um, so some people's bodies are pretty efficient at it. It may be something worth asking your doctor, hey, can we just check my levels and make sure that they're okay? Um, and that's a great question and also a very simple blood test that's usually covered by insurance. Great. We have another question. Um, have you heard of Dr. Brooke Goldner? She claims she cured and has been in remission for 17 years by being on a raw vegan diet and hyper nourishing on cruciferous vegetables and flax chia seeds. Yeah, so that is definitely one approach that clients have come to me a lot of times after they've tried the six week version of that and felt as though this is not something I can follow long term. I am not criticizing it. I love that it includes lots of vegetables, but a, a raw food vegan diet can be socially isolating. You can't necessarily go to a lot of restaurants and eat. Um, and some people just don't want to pursue something like that. So it's certainly one approach and it can certainly help some people with lupus. Um, it depends on the person for sure, um, but it's not it's not going to be the right fit for everyone. Sure. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions coming in from our patients or, or our attendees? Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. It doesn't, I'll give you a couple more minutes. Um, do you recommend that patients, and you might've said this already, now I'm thinking about it. Anyhow, work with their doctors, their rheumatologists as well to talk about their diet. And 100%, definitely. The only reason I guess I didn't say that loud and insistent before is that some rheumatologists will say, I mean, I have heard from clients, a rheumatologist say something like, you can eat whatever you want go get ice cream, go get a burger. And I'm like, really? That's yeah. not a great choice for people just in general consistently. So unfortunately, I think that there is a, and I educate rheumatologists on these sorts of things. I'm not pulling this out of thin air. Like these are scientific studies that have said that this is great for people with lupus. I think there's a lack of full understanding in rheumatologists of the research that has been done on diet and lupus. Um, I think that sometimes rheumatologists and they do have a lot on their plate. They need to be worried about labs and prescriptions and that aspect of care are just not willing to touch the diet and nutrition portion of things. Totally fine. That's why dietitians exist. Um, so I always recommend people clue their doctors into, hey, I'm making dietary changes. What do you think about this? Um, and hopefully they are a supportive voice. But some rheumatologists are just kind of like, well, well okay, well, sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but I think okay. that was just such a fantastic presentation. So Thank interesting. You. So useful for everyone. We truly appreciate your time and um, loved having you here today. I hope we can have you back again. Definitely. And this was wonderful. It's such an honor to be here. I'm so glad to share the information. I would love to come back again. So, everyone, enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Tanya. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye. Take care. Um, so, everyone else, thank you so much for attending today. We really appreciate this. We hope that you got a lot out of it. Um, again, this will be on demand um, later on, probably next week. So watch your email um, for that. And also, if you could do us a favor, Tom mentioned it at the beginning, but 
please take the survey, um, answer the questions, let us know what you liked and what you didn't like about today's and what topics you're interested in hearing more about because this is the only way we can plan better um, conferences in the future for you. So it will, will pop up after, um, after you log off today. Uh, we also have a, another lupus conference that's going to be scheduled for August 19th. And in that we will have a cardiologist from the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota discussing uh, lupus or rheumatology and cardiology. So I think that'll be very interesting and will be followed by um, Reagan Burr and exercise uh, time with Reagan Burr. So hopefully you can join us with that. Reagan is continuing to offer her Reagan moves throughout May and as um, a, a great option for uh, lupus patients and your families, we the Lupus Foundation is going to cover the cost of her classes for all of our community for the rest of this year. So you can continue to join Reagan on these exercises that are quite easy, low impact um, exercises from your home or office. Tuesdays and Thursdays for the rest of the year. So be sure to keep an eye on that. You'll get new Zoom information um, quarterly. So we're excited to, to present that. Um, but if you have any other questions or need additional resources, be sure to check out our website, www.lfnc.org. And if you have any questions, you can always email me at communications at lfnc.org. I hope you all had a good day today. I hope you really enjoyed it and you have a great weekend. Watch our social media and our websites and emails for upcoming information and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Lori. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.